But the implicit promise, I think, on a baseline level that colleges make to you is that you're going to be able to get a degree. What percentage of public college entrants would you say fail to graduate in four years? I'll bet it's really high, actually. It's 68%. 68% of people who go in there with full belief that they're going to come out with a degree, um, within four years they don't have that degree. But they do have the debt. It's, it's unconscionable what we're doing to people under the guise of offering them opportunity. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam, and this is The Vice Podcast Show. I'm joined today by Anya Kamenetz a Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation, a celebrated journalist, and author of a number of books, including Generation Debt, DIYU, and the forthcoming The Test. Anya, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a very long time, I'd say many decades, during which Americans have thought of college as a ticket to a solid, stable, middle-class life. The idea was that, you know, if you, if you pay attention in school, if you, if you, you know, kind of dot your I's, cross your T's, and you just get that degree, then everything else will follow, and your wages are going to increase, and, and, and all will be well. But it seems that there are a lot of Americans who are thinking, this is a raw deal. This isn't working uh, as, you know, we had hoped. Uh, and a lot of people are questioning whether college is, is a god that failed. What do you make of this? Are people exaggerating? Is this crazy? Are they are they being silly? Well, you know, it, it, it's really complicated. I mean, America has this strange dual nature of being a meritocracy and a democracy at the same time. So we want to believe that the best people get ahead, and we want to believe that there's an equal chance for everyone. And during a time in the 20th century when a rising tide was lifting all boats, it was sort of possible to paper over that distinction by increasing the franchise of higher education. During the 1960s, you know, 1940s, the, the GI Bill in 1965, the, the Higher Education Act, the growth of community college system all the way through um, most of the 20th century up until the 70s, uh, this kind of worked. More and more people got college degrees and they were able to move up in the world. I think that you know um, my, my father would qualify as a member of this kind of expanded franchise, went to Yale on a near full scholarship in the 1960s as a you know son of an immigrant shopkeeper. Um, you know, you might count yourself as, as a member of this expansion as well, but the trend has changed. Um, and, and what happened is, you know, America stopped being able to uh, keep everybody happy because our economy had contracted, um, you know, many, many reasons. You could talk about why, why we went into stagnation in the 70s. But ultimately what happened as well was that um, public support for higher education went down, graduation rates went down, minorities stopped gaining ground relative to whites in, in high education attainment. And the cost just kept, just started to rise in this unprecedented fashion so that now, you know, for those of us who are in our 30s or younger, um, for most of our lifetimes, the cost of college tuition has been growing faster than any other good or service. Um, and so as the cost continues to grow, the cost-benefit analysis of higher education necessarily changes. So we, you just introduced a, a lot of stuff, and I just yeah. want to wanna just unpack a little bit. So one thing, drawing from what you just said, is that, okay, so there was this huge expansion in mid-century that was tied to economic growth, arguably also tied to larger geopolitical currents. Yeah. We feared the Soviets, we feared Sputnik, we've got to get more people with a science and math education. But it's, it's interesting to note that, you know, in early America, uh, you know, the earliest colleges served a tiny number of people. They served, uh, you know, th these were largely divinity schools. It was just a, a really tiny, tiny thing. And then, it, it, tell us a little bit about that era and, and just, a, just a little sketch of how higher education grew before that big boom in uh, you know, the, the mid 20th century. Yeah, I mean, you know, college, uh, for all of its sort of um, responsibility to teach, to teach history, um, they have really been responsible for alighting and presenting a false uh, sense of their own history because every college in America, in some sense, wants to tie itself back to Harvard. Um, which was one of the first colonial colleges. And to do that, they want to present sort of a false picture of what was happening during that era. But what really, you know, if you, if you really 
dial back into the history of the earliest colonial colleges, and a lot of the Ivy Leagues are in this category, um, they were very small. They were, you know, f the places for people who were often the second sons of the families, um, were not uh, meant to necessarily inherit, but needed to be prepared for um, either the, the clergy or for a trade. Um, and they had very- it was, the it was the leftover sons. I mean, because the, the son that mattered was the one who was going to take on the family mantle and whatever. Right, way. and there was never a widespread belief in American society that a college degree or a further education was something that would necessarily make you economically successful. I mean, this was something that was prestigious in some sense, but in a lot of ways it was also kind of an afterthought. Um, and so you had a really, really small group of people that participated in any kind of univers university education for essentially the first millennia that it existed. Um, and it was only coming into you know, the 19th century in America's kind of mass expansionism and really huge proliferation of, of, um, of industry and of these new kinds of titans of industry, many of whom had not gone to college themselves, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. Um, they were self-taught, largely. They were absolutely self-taught and, and taught in any way that they could, but um, decided that for prestigious reasons and to uh, boost their hometowns, that they would want to be the fathers of new kinds of institutions, universities, that would uh, sort of trade on and build on the prestige that had been established by the colonial colleges. And that prestige, in a way, reflected the intake it reflected the fact that they were drawing on students who came from the most privileged elite backgrounds, even if they were the second sons and that came to evolve. But in a way it wasn't so much, it seems that you know Harvard or Yale or what have you was transforming you, person who comes in. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a finishing school, right? I mean, it was just kind of like, we're kind of ratifying who you already are. We're accepting people who are like us. I mean, who kind of like reflect the values that we already hold. Um, Whereas it seems that the more modern meritocratic vision is this idea that you know, we will find talent wherever it is uh, and we will shape you and we will make you a better person in various ways and prepare you for the wider world. Um, and, and sometimes you wonder, I mean, is that really what's going on? Mm -hmm. Particularly when you look at elite universities. Mm -hmm. you know, is that really, I mean, when you think about the idea of selection, mm -hmm. you, you know, why select? Right, right. I mean, this is this is absolutely the case that you know higher education has become this sort of black box, and we don't really know what goes on inside the price of process of higher ed. But the the claim that what's actually happening is that um, a, a Harvard or Yale is making leaders, as opposed to simply selecting people who have all kinds of advantages to begin with, um, you know, it's really not just not that supported by the evidence. Well, on the other hand, you know, what we've seen through the history of American higher education from the 19th century on, um, you know, as you've uh, discussed, is this great expansion. You know, then you have the land-grant colleges. I mean, that was kind of one big thing, um, you know, throughout the territories, let's try to create these institutions that in some ways mimic the elite universities, but are also more inclusive, right. or that are starting to do things like, we're not just going to teach Greek philology or, you know, kind of, you know, what have you, we're going to also teach agricultural mechanics. We're right. going to teach, we're going to teach teachers. Right. Uh, we're going to, you know, sort of try to kind of, you know, do this thing that's going to be more service oriented toward the wider world. Right. Um, and that the community colleges in a way seem to want to do something similar as well, albeit in a different context. Do you see that as an effort that was kind of largely successful, that effort to kind of broaden it out and to kind of introduce these new, um, well, you know, so the, so the more people particip that participate in higher education or that we're trying to attract to participate in higher education, the more we're drawn toward making these sort of economic arguments that higher education is going to be useful to you, that it's a good personal investment, um, and that it's good for, you know, it's good for your community as well. Um, and, you know, on a, on a broad scale, very generally, this is borne out by the evidence. You do see that when people get a degree, a diploma, it has a, you know, an impact on lifetime earnings and that sort of thing. So there is, although we can't say exactly how it works, there is some kind of process effect that comes from education. And therefore, I think that, I don't think the claims that a university makes to being a public service are necessarily hollow, but the, the point to keep in mind is that universities are, like any institution, created to serve fundamentally their own welfare and their own success and their own expansion. And the claims that they make on behalf of service to others, service to the disciplines and scholarship or service to the public, communities, service certainly to students and alumni, um, those claims are really secondary to their number one point of order, which is to perpetuate and expand themselves. Wow, <laughs> that is breathtakingly cynical and interesting because it's certainly true that when you think about the prestige of the modern American university, think about the prestige afforded to presidents um, right. of universities or also just in any political debate. Um, it, 
well, until very recently, but I mean, I think that you know, you could say that people who are the champions of higher education and expanding higher education just had a huge advantage over everybody else because yes. it's kind of like mom and apple pie. I mean, who doesn't want as many people as possible to go to college? And these are the people who know best. These are the people who kind of you know want to grow these institutions for the for the greater good, presumably. And what you're saying is that, well, wait a second. There is something called education that might be a good and valuable thing. And then there are these institutions. And education is part of what they do, but it's right. not all of what they do. Right. And sometimes the mission of, of kind of bettering people's lives and the internal imperatives of these colleges and universities might clash. Oh, I mean, I, you know, and I actually don't agree that that's cynical. I think that you have, anytime you have any organized human behavior um, or any organization, it's going to, to work toward its own ends, that there are someone independent of the people within it. And if you look at the way university is organized explicitly, um, you know, you could put its, its functions into several different buckets, but basically, you know, just sticking with the land-grant colleges um, and institutions over, you know, from the 19th century up, to, up till the 1930s, um, they, the professors themselves got organized um, and sort of created a very, they professionalized themselves. Um, and, you know, where what had been a very low paid and sort of um, a profession, again, for clergy members who weren't good enough to attract their own congregations, um, basically clerks or who, who read from very, um, uh, very kind of uh, rote uh, curricula that didn't really change much from decade to decade in the 19th century completely turned around because of the expansion of science and research um, to people that really control their own fiefdoms, you know, the disciplines, anthropology, psychology, economics, um, physics, and, and on and on. And, and these were like industrial scale endeavors sometimes. They produced huge amounts of economic re return and um, they, they captured research money. They became very closely associated with the workings of the government. Um, and in the 1930s in particular, this is part of the progressive movement, the idea that you should have a technocracy and who really should be in charge um, of making decisions in the government, writing policy papers and writing the laws that were passed, should be PhDs. Those are the people who really should be in charge of things. And this was seen as an improvement over the patronage systems of the past and, and sort of the very aristocratic power uh, paths that we'd had up to that point. Um, so just like in the past, like some, you know, like Charles Darwin, some rich guy, you know, kind of decides to explore stuff in a very unsystematic way, whereas now we've industrialized the process and, you know, we have the credential and we're training each other to all be part of this common intellectual endeavor that's that, very disciplined. That's exactly right. And the cabinet and the the, the ministry, you know, the, the different groups within the government um, sh should all be advised by people who have been through this university system. Um, and so what that actually ends up doing is that the experts are the people who come through the system and they continue to contribute more and more power to the system that they came from. Because how do you know that someone's an expert? It's because they have a credential from a university. It's kind of, it's like a guild, or it's kind of, you could describe it as this kind of racket in which, <laughs> you know, if you're opposed to the system of creating expertise, yeah. then you're undermining my credentials right. as an expert. Right. So I must defend the system. And it's interesting because when you think about Abraham Lincoln, he was a guy who just took the bar exam. Right. He never went to law school. Um, I imagine many elite law schools would be delighted to claim him as an right. alumnus, but uh, he was not. Right. Whereas, you know, kind of now, virtually every state requires that you attend an accredited law school. Well, and we haven't had a, a, a president of the United States who wasn't a college graduate for, for hundreds of years, you know, over a hundred years. Um, Which is interesting because, you know, in earlier, I mean, you know, even, you know, in the you know twenties, thirties, forties, I mean, it was really rare right. for uh, you know an adult. We're you know, talking about five percent of the population. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and that's grown, um, which which has expanded people's access to to politics. But the point being that you have to come through this system, and I think well, actually one of the most illuminating. Um, points toward this this that I have uh, come across is in studying the sociology of higher education. Mitchell Stevens, who's a sociologist at Stanford and, and the head of a higher research group there, has pointed out that the literature on higher ed, university as an institution, it is so thin compared to the literature on prisons, the literature on hospitals, the literature on any other institution in our society. There's this reluctance on the part of the sociologist to turn inward and look at the the mother that feeds them, you know, their own their, their own hand, the, the hand that keeps them. People who are uh, brilliant and incisive critics of many other institutions, uh, you know, it seems rare that they turn uh, to the institutions that produce them. Uh, right. There's this uh, wonderful recent book called Academically Adrift that yeah. was trying to track, um, you know, learning outcomes uh, for students when they enter college and when they leave. And what's amazing about the book is that all the schools are anonymous. Right. I mean, 
no one wants to disclose the information. It was actually kind of amazing that they were able to right. you know, kind of do the research in the first place. But that right. to me seemed really telling. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that was based on the collegiate learning assessment, which again is a voluntary test that, that colleges um, give, some colleges give to their students. They use the, the information internally. They do not share it. It's very interesting right now because the Obama administration is turning toward um, you know, wanting to impose some kind of accountability metrics on higher education, not only in the for-profit sector, which has been politically more easy, but now he wants to turn it towards public institutions as well. And there is such a, you know, people are so up in arms over this idea that colleges should be measured by any outcomes at all. But, you know, uh, the president of Harvard was, I believe, in the Times with an op-ed saying, you know, college does all these things that are, that are totally, you know, um, beneficial in every single way to individuals, to society, and we never could put a metric on it, um, saying that, you know, they don't want their, their graduates measured on their income, which is silly for Harvard, because I'm sure they do fine. But, you know, my counter to that would just be to say, you can measure all of those outcomes. There's no reason to, not to. Um, you can measure people's uh, health. You can measure how they do uh, in their professions. You can measure how much they volunteer and how you know, how long they stay married, and all of these things are possible. In fact, Harvard has done longitudinal studies of exactly this type. And so if, you know, why are you so averse to measuring the very process of higher education in a way that is traceable back to individual institutions? Well, the cynical theory is that the reason not to do it is that colleges are over-promising and under-delivering. And, and that's something I want to talk to you a little bit about now. So, in your first book, Generation Debt, uh, you were talking about the challenges facing the millennial generation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the broad premise was that whereas the baby boom generation had profited from, uh, for example, a big expansion of the public sector, a big uh, increase in investments in higher education and much else, your argument was that people um, who are younger, uh, they were facing a very different, far more challenging landscape, which would make the upward mobility of their parents' generation uh, a lot more challenging. So you published that book some years ago, long before uh, you know, we had the big recession and, and the stagnation that's followed. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel as though your predictions were borne out? I mean, they weren't so much predictions as descriptions of economic trends that were very much in place at the time that I wrote it. And yet, the discourse at the time, back in 2006, um, Time Magazine had on the cover, you know, a picture of a, a boy, in his, a man in his 20s, sitting in a sandbox. And, and the, the, t the title on there was, oh, they won't grow up. You know, why are the millennials so stuck in, in extended childhood? And I was really one of the, at the time, a lone voice in the wilderness, or so it felt, pointing out that, hey, maybe the reason that kid moved back home after college is because he's got $27,000 of student loan debt, and there are no jobs um, in his uh, in his uh, field, and the ones that he can find are temporary, part-time, um, freelance, they don't have any benefits. And so actually he's making an economic decision, not an emotional one, and this whole idea that millennials are somehow putting off um, you know, adult decision-making, well, the fact is that they are putting off adult decision-making from an economically very reasonable point of view, if you have that kind of debt, it doesn't make sense to start a, a new household on your own. It doesn't make sense to get married or have children. You're not going to be able to qualify for a mortgage. And so these things I thought were being misinterpreted as um, as psychological somehow. As laziness or something like that. As laziness, as childishness, um, narcissism. There was a, an author who got very far sort of talking about how this was generation me. Um, and I was just saying, you know, there, there's an Occam's razor explanation here, and that is that these kids have been facing, um, you know, the Pell Grant no longer pays for a public a public education. Um, people are having to borrow to get through school, and they're taking on a lot of credit card debt at the same time. And when they get out, um, I mean, the numbers right now are that about a half of recent college graduates are either unemployed or they're employed in a job that does not require a college degree. It's shocking. Um, now, when you're talking about this, so part of the theory here is that in a world in which you do have those employment opportunities, I mean, you often hear that during a period of robust economic expansion, people just move faster. So for right. example, something that would be an internship during a recession will be a job, will be an entry level job, and that person will just kind of move up faster just because there's more opportunities for expansion. Whereas right. now, you have people stuck, and I certainly see this, you know, being a little bit older than some you know, people who are graduating during this time of economic turmoil, mm -hmm. I just sometimes think to myself, gosh, this is a very conscientious, hardworking person who has been in the same job for three or four years that I would have thought of as very much an entry level right. kind of thing. Um, and, and that must actually have lots of cultural consequences too, right? I mean, I certainly see it that way. I think that, you know, it's, 
people don't always interpret their their personal experiences in terms of larger economic trends. I mean, very few people actually have the um, the, the perspective, honestly, to, to be able to do that, especially when the culture and the news is telling us something totally different. But when you have people um, who graduate into a recession, you know, um, you can see this on an anecdotal basis. You don't grab, you don't take the best job possible for your skills and your interests. You grab the one thing, the first thing you can find, and the cascading consequences of that ill fit, you know, that desperate grab for the first work or the only work you can find, really does make itself felt all the way through your, your whole career because you're not, you know, you're not in that position where you're learning the most or being able to uh, build on your strengths. You're really kind of scrambling for the next thing. And so, um, you know, these impacts are very, very measurable and I think they do become emotional over time. And they become depressing and then it, it seems natural to kind of turn to the other things in your life that might be a source of meaning. Right. Um, so, I mean, when you're talking about this huge share mm -hmm. of college graduates who are either underemployed, that is to say working jobs that didn't require uh, a college uh, degree uh, or who are just simply not able to find work. Is it fair to say that their colleges have failed them? Because another perspective is that, you know, look, we did our best, we educated you the best we can, and, and we sure do think that the money that you spent here was absolutely worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The economy stinks, and um, you know, that's not our fault. That's the fault, let's say, of, of Washington, D.C., of bad macroeconomic policies and much else. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can't really blame us the colleges for the fact that you're having a hard time, uh, you know, and, and we really wish you the best and really we've put you in a much better position than you would have been in otherwise had you not gone. Uh, does that, you know, what, what do you think of that argument? I mean, I think the best way to answer that question is in reference to the college, the, the people that don't graduate from college. You know, what percentage of public college graduates would you say, public college entrants would you say fail to graduate in four years? I'll bet it's really high actually. It's 68%. 68% of people who go in there with full belief that they're going to come out with a degree, um, within four years they don't have that degree. 56% have, have graduated within six years. So that's another you know, 50% in terms of tuition and everything else. Um, in the Cal State system, the, the biggest system in the country, it's 84% who fail to graduate in four years. And so the implicit promise, I think on a baseline level, that colleges make to you is that you're going to be able to get a degree. Um, and most people don't. So where does that leave the the all of the promises and all of the all of the rosiness that they? So what you're telling us people? is that there are people who are coming into these systems believing that they're going to finish a degree, they work at it for five six years, and then even after six years, there are many who aren't finishing, uh, and they don't have the degree, but they do have the debt. They are massively, robustly the majority. There are 37 million Americans in this country. There are 37 million Americans with some college and no degree. That's almost equal to the number of people who have bachelor's degrees, and that's across all age groups. And and that of that 37 million, there's some who presumably have uh, you know paid off their debt or what have you. But there's a decent number who are still burdened by it. Yeah, well, I mean, one of them is Mark Zuckerberg, right? But most of them have uh, a student loan debt that is uh, either in deferment or else it's in default. And that's frankly not doing all that much for them in terms of increasing their earning potential or whatever else. Absolutely not. I mean, the, the sheepskin effect is very real. If you go to school for three years and leave with no diploma, you're worse off than someone who earned an associate's degree in two years. So one issue here, though, is that when I'm, you know, from the perspective of a higher education institution, mm -hmm. if I'm telling you, you are going to finish, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say you're a low-income student who comes attached with federal aid and much else, yeah. Do I have to give that money back when the person doesn't graduate? Like, uh, you know, because that would kind of make sense if the person right. doesn't actually graduate. You know, presumably I'm getting this aid from the public sector right. because the idea is that this student who will benefit will earn a higher income mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, thus, you know, be, you know, pay more in taxes or whatever else will, you know, it'll be an investment in our future. Mm -hmm. If that person doesn't wind up graduating, well, you know, that hasn't, that deal hasn't been fully fulfilled yet. So the college has to give the money back, right? <laughs> Right, that would be great if it were a standard consumer deal, you know, satisfaction and your money back, but it just doesn't work that way. You know, colleges and universities don't make, don't have any guarantees for the tuition dollars that they take from so people. So they keep the money Absolutely. from the people who don't 
ever graduate. Absolutely, they keep your money. And they probably keep the money from people who really had no realistic prospect of graduating well, without more support. That is a really important point. You know, there was a test imposed on the for-profit sector called ability to benefit, because the for-profit college sector has been, had been notorious for, in the, in the 70s and 80s, recruiting people right out of homeless shelters and out of welfare uh, centers and signing them up, getting their Pell Grants, and then saying, see you later. So ability to benefit is basically at the level of a GED test. Um, but the problem and the discrepancy that we have right now is that a majority of public school, high school graduates in this country need remedial classes when they get to college. And in, in, here in New York City, they started tracking this in 2010, and they discovered four out of five public high school graduates need remedial classes when they get to community college. Four out of five. And when you have remedial classes, that means you are paying college tuition for a high school course. And most of the people who need to take a remedial course never graduate. I mean, I'm talking about the vast majority. 85% of people who need a remedial course don't graduate. When college courses are also structured so differently, they don't necessarily provide you with the same discipline and structure that one might need at that age in order to master certain You're not basic with the skills. same people every day. You're not, you're not there every day. I mean, if you're a commuter, you're probably coming into campus three or four times a week. You're not necessarily forming strong relationships with people. And all of these are, I mean, some community colleges are creating programs and, and that sort of mimic high school much more closely because they've seen that if you're accountable to a group of 20 or 25 people, if you have an advisor that you're meeting with once a week, if you have a teacher that you really get to know for several hours a day, damn, if your teacher is actually trained in teaching remedial algebra, which most college And it's not someone who is resentful at having to do this at all because they don't think Freshman comp or right. remedial because this is something that PhD students do not get, you know, much training or at all in classroom management or basic um, techniques. You know, the, the high school teacher that that person had the year before, even in the worst urban system, had way more training on education and teaching than the college instructor that they are, they're likely to see the next year. It's amazing. So one, you know, one concern is that, well, if you're giving them this kind of intensive instruction, that's presumably going to be pretty expensive. On the other hand, uh, if they don't get it and they just flunk out, then... There's nothing, gonna... there's nothing more expensive than, flunk, than than churning people through the way that we're doing it right now. In fact, there was a program I wrote about in the Village Voice last year um, that CUNY has in, in, in introduced, and um, with this kind of intensive extra resources. The fact is that it's so much better at graduating people, it doubles the graduation rate. And so even though, though it's much more expensive per student, it's 10% less expensive per graduate. That's fascinating. So what you're telling me is that if your actual goal is to get people who have a degree then it's actually cheap to do this, to kind of like, uh, to actually kind of devote these resources. Mm -hmm. If your goal is to just have a huge number of people churning through the system, yeah. many of whom will never finish, yeah. then don't provide people with the support and resources they need. Well, and I want to look, us to look at it from a moral standpoint as well, because if the message that we're sending people is a false promise of a degree, you churn someone through this vast and personal, um, you know, overloaded bureaucracy of a community college system, they're shut out of the classes that they need, they can barely get in touch with anyone except the bursar's office when their tuition check is late, then they conclude that it's their fault, that they just weren't cut out for college, never mind that they had to work 35 hours a week at Taco Bell and their car broke down when they tried to get to school. You know, it's their fault. They're the ones who failed. Um, and the college bears zero responsibility for that. Compare that to a perspective where a college says, you and I are in this together. Our concern is your success. You are important. You have the ability to learn. And you have the ability to take control of your life. Um, you know, I, I think that it's really, it's, it's unconscionable what we're doing to people under the guise of offering them opportunity. It's interesting because it seems that so many of the conversations about higher education that we have um, in the, let's say, the prestige media mm -hmm. tend to be fixated <laughs> on a very small handful yeah. of elite schools, what they're doing, um, and they just represent such a tiny, tiny share of the number of Americans who are doing their best to go to college um, and to uh, you know, make it a worthwhile experience for them. I wonder, there's another way of looking at this, which is that, okay, you, know, you make some valid points, you make some valid criticisms, but the problem is that there are a lot of people who make these valid criticisms of the higher education industry, yet 
who are very hostile to it. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who think, well, you know, when I hear all these complaints, I hear, you know, it's happening in a context of defunding these right. schools. Uh, you know, we want the resources to get this right. And if we don't have the resources, you know, how can we possibly do this? Right. And then, you know, you have people talking about how like, oh, well, you know, we can do it this other way, we can do it in this, you know, and all of these innovations mm -hmm. seem to be about squeezing existing college professors because you know these professors right. you know they're people who are trained they've devoted a huge amount of their lives uh, to becoming professors right. and then you know when you squeeze the more and more you squeeze them the harder it is for them to do their job right. so I mean you know that's another question I mean you know are you just going to replace them with robots I mean sort of, you know what's what's going to happen because you know right. a, there are a lot of people who are teaching in higher education institutions who are very skeptical about these kinds of criticisms of higher education institutions right. because they're like look it's not us that's the problem it's not the higher ed institutions that are the problem. It's the government that's the problem right. for not offering more generous loans to students, for not making it free for people to go to college. Right. That's the real problem, according right. to this line of critique. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been walking these lines for a long time, Rahan, and, you know, it is extremely complicated. The university has always had these different stakeholders with much, very different understandings of um, the process of higher ed and, and why it works and how it works. And I think that it's true, you know, the, the, the gospel of, for example, completion. I just talked about some of the research about remediation and completion and people talking about we need to focus on a completion agenda, This we need to bring efficiency to higher education, we need to bring metrics and data to higher education. This is a very business-driven perspective, and it is often ties into, um, you know, a narrow perspective, which does come, you know, from a pretty conservative place, that higher education is an economic investment, both for individuals as well as for the nation. This perspective often slights um, the, the knowledge production functions of higher education, um, not to mention sort of almost the, the moral and spiritual aspects of the relationships that are built within higher education and sort of turns those into networking or, you know, access to opportunities through people that you meet in, in this sort of na very narrow way. Um, and the idea that in addition to increase, which I, you know, I advocate that in addition to increasing public funding for education, which I think should be a priority, um, that we should actually change the cost structure of how it's delivered and to bring in these kinds of uh, innovations in, in teaching and learning. Um, that is a very controversial idea. Yeah, that and, sounds very scary because right. when you say change the cost structure, I mean, you know, universities, um, including community colleges, right. have functioned according to a certain logic for a long time. Um, you know, you, you do your job, you do your job reasonably well, right. you get tenured, so you get academic freedom right. um, and, you know, the wherewithal to, do, to, to have the economic security to do this kind of job well. Mm -hmm. And then I think that when a lot of people hear talk of flexibility right. and changing things. Okay, so what you want to do is hire a bunch of part-time people who are paid virtually nothing right. to do this kind of work that's extremely difficult to do. Right. Uh, you, know, you can imagine there'd be a ton of resentment when people hear talk of changing these arrangements that people have built their lives around. So when you talk about the existing cost structure in higher ed, um, the casualization of, of faculty, of teaching staff, is well underway. So the, the average cost to teach um, a student in a classroom has actually gone down quite a bit in the last 50 years because of the enormous growth of adjuncts, um, of part-time, uh, you know, sometimes poverty wage, no benefits instructors. And those are the people who are shouldering the bulk of classroom hours, including at some of our most elite institutions. That has nothing to do with the innovation that's going on now. It has done nothing to expand the franchise of higher education. It's made it, it's hollowed out the cost and made it cheaper um, in some ways for administrations that they've been spending the money on many other things, including on their own salaries. Administrative fa staff growth has far outpaced faculty growth um, across the higher education sector. Let's talk about this a little bit. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so I, I think that when people think about the money that goes to higher education, they tend yeah. to think this is money that is going to educate kids. That's ideally, the it's going, that's Ideally, it's going to educate, you know, poor and middle income kids who, who right. want to cr climb the economic ladder. And it's oftentimes these professors um, who are thinking like we need a lot more resources. Yet right. there seems to be this mismatch where it seems that over time there the cost the costs have increased, yet you're telling me that it hasn't really increased all that much for teaching, which you'd think would be the core mission. So where exactly has the money been going? Well, it's a very good question. I think, um, you know, uh, in the biggest level, you could say that the, the money goes toward competing with other institutions. And I know that's sort of a circular argument, but but the point that, you know, for example, let, let's look, I mean, various, various sectors are very different, but let's look at, uh, at public institutions, public universities. Um, you know, public universities, uh, 
within each state. There's flagship institutions, there's regional institutions, there are the small sort of teachers' colleges. Um, and so the teachers' colleges want to become universities, the regional universities want to compete with the flagship university, and the flagship university of one state wants to compete the, with the flagships of the other states, and ideally with the private sector institutions as well. And so what they, the way that they all can compete is to climb the ladder, to offer more programs, to go from being masters-only institutions to offering PhDs, to hire more faculty, to cover more departments, um, and then to grow, then they have to get more students, and ideally more out-of-state students, because out-of-state students, they're allowed to charge double the tuition. So uh, in order to get out-of-state students, you need to have all the amenities that a private institution has, because out-of-state students um, are in the same sort of income category as, as people who are going to the private sector. You're competing for those affluent students with these elite schools. And so. often, um, to an ex increasing amount these days, international students as well, who don't even participate in the federal um, higher education aid programs. So, um, so you need to basically hire marquee professors. And then in order to do all of this, what do you need? You need compliance um, specialists. You need enrollment management specialists. There are PhD programs in this country in enrollment management, which is the art of reaping, taking a bunch of applications and reaping the class that gets you the highest U.S. News and World Report rankings and the highest tuition revenue. Wow. So reading the, the, the numbers, doing the statistics, figuring out um, you know, how to balance those two, when to give merit aid, most of the money, scholarship money, goes um, to, more toward merit and to middle class students than it does to poor students because it's used as discount money that you flash in from, some, front of an, a prestigious student to get them to come to your institution rather than someone else. So if I may, yeah. you're talk land grant schools that were established you know, on the frontier so we could find people who could um, help increase agricultural yields or be school teachers. These have now become institutions that are trying to attract the most affluent students possible. Um, the strongest students, not necessarily the students who would benefit from the most from access to this kind of education, um, so that they can be more attractive to other affluent students that they can then attract. Well, and, and, um, and then you have to look at the growth in the development office, because in order to do this, it requires raising a lot of funds um, in order to, you know, so you have to do a lot of alumni relationship stuff, you'll, and you have to hire presidents who are really good fundraisers. That's the major uh, activity of most presidents today, just as it is the major activity of most lawmakers, getting on the phone, soliciting donations, right? So, um, so the fact that they're earning enormous salaries kind of makes sense, given the fact that their job is to bring money in. And that's absolutely right. And the same thing is true of prestige faculty members. I mean, um, a good, you know, if you get a good guy in, uh, in, in, his, in a hard science or in engineering, he's going to bring in the grants, the grant money, the federal grant money and the private grant money that's going to um, sustain and allow these the, the programs to grow. So that's another major source of revenue for a lot of these research institutions. If you're not a research institution, you don't get that kind of stuff. So you have to, you better become a research institution if you want to expand. Why don't they just specialize? Why don't you just think, well, you know what, I'm a community college, I'm going to be really good at that. I'm a teacher's college, I'm a, a master's only institution. I just want to totally focus on that. Those guys can do their thing, and I'm just happy to just do this job really, really well. Well, I think the incentives just aren't there for that kind of differentiation. For First of all, you know, every institution in the higher education sector wants to be Harvard. There's only one prestige ladder. Um, you don't get recognition for being, you know, people say I'm the Harvard of this, I'm the Harvard of that, but you don't get recognition for being Foothill Community College in, in uh in Silicon Valley, which does some of the most innovative programs anywhere in the country, that you know, that's just not a household name. So you're not being rewarded for having, you know, being a school that takes in a lot of low-income uh, students and graduates them right. within, you know, four to six years. Right, you don't, you don't nobody, get a ton of credit. For we them. don't really publish those numbers. We don't really pay a lot of attention to them. I mean, the U.S. News and World Report rankings are based on, and I, I in, in DIYU, I interviewed, you know, the guy that puts them together and introduced those rankings and. They're based on very easy to get metrics like class size and um, oftentimes the pay of faculty members. Um, and they're not based on, gra I mean, graduation rates as reported, but certainly not um, you know, percentages or the, the amount that people actually learn. It's not in there. And also, not they're not breaking it out for type of student a lot of the time, I assume. They, they absolutely don't control for the type of student. I mean, you don't see, I mean, there are community college lists on there, but you don't see, you know, of the people that, you're, that your mission is specifically supposed to be serving, how many of them are you actually serving, and, and how well do you do it with the money that you get from them? So, in a sense, what you're telling us is that when you focus just on the money going into the schools uh, and say that you know, the, the thing to do is to get more money to go into them, that's not necessarily the right way to think about it because you have lots of constituencies within the schools and they have lots of imperatives that are leading to this kind of arms race yeah. uh, in which they're spending money on things that might attract 
more money and prestige, sports teams being one example, yeah. but they're not necessarily focusing those resources um, on actually giving students um, not just marketable skills, but just giving them a high quality education. It's very similar to healthcare um, in that the, co you know, the costs seem to be running out of control and it really is kind of a snake pit trying to figure out why. Um, but one of the major reasons is that there are, you know, it's not a transparent marketplace to say the least. People are not qualified, they don't feel qualified to make informed decisions about their own educations because in f there it is, you've got the expertise and I don't, so who am I to say whether this is a better college or that's a better college? Not to mention the existence of the discounting, which is what you would call merit aid, as well as um, federal student aid and especially student loans. All of this makes the price uh, less of a, of a major issue. When people are shopping for higher ed, they don't know the relationship between the sticker price and what they're actually going to pay. So if I'm a poor kid, I don't necessarily have a sophisticated understanding of all of that stuff. I see the sticker price and it might just deter me from applying at all. Whereas if I'm a kid from a ritzy suburb, I know a lot of other people went to these schools, I know how to navigate it, and, and it's, yeah. it's all cool. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of data on the idea that poor, high-achieving kids tend to undermatch. They're afraid to apply to these more uh, prestigious institutions because um, they don't think the money's gonna be there for them, where the fact is that if you earn less than $40,000 a year, you're, you know, you're a very rare commodity if you have decent SAT scores, and the chances of getting um, a scholarship can be pretty good in that category. Colleges do a terrible job recruiting poor and middle-class kids and making this clear to them because uh, you know, in the final analysis, even the ones that have the resources don't really want to invest them in you know, helping a struggling student succeed, one who doesn't have family support and other kinds of support. Um, you know, as much as that's normally their mission, you can count the number of schools that do a good job with that on one hand. I think Amherst and Princeton are, are two that are, that are well known for that. But in the prestigious category, um, you know, mostly these, these schools don't really do very much to um, do what you think they might want to do, which is discover diamonds in the rough. A few months ago, you released a report called One Trillion Dollars and Rising, uh, which I thought was extraordinarily brilliant. Um, now, one thing about this report is just the number in the yeah. title. And can you explain where the number in the title comes from? Yeah, um, the student loan debt in this country, outstanding student loan debt is over a trillion dollars, which is more than credit card debt. It's fascinating. And, and the report itself, um, you know, you're someone who's been critical um, of the existing higher education system, mm -hmm. but here you kind of put your money where your mouth is and you offered a broad rethinking of public higher education and, and how it ought to work. Uh, tell us a little bit about the impetus for the project and also about some of the ideas for how we might change the system to make it work better for students. So Third Way, which is a centrist think tank, really came to me and they said, um, you know, you have all these interesting ideas about higher education, how would you like to you know, given a green field, a clean sheet of paper, just write what you think, how you think it should work. And I was really excited by the opportunity to sort of create a positive program and to integrate all of the great things I'd read about innovations. Because as much as I'm a critic of higher education, Raihan, I am out there seeing what really amazing innovative teachers and administrations are doing all over the country. This is a really diverse sector um, in, in America, and there's so many great things going on. And so. Um, the $10,000 degree uh, was really my attempt to kind of synthesize all the stuff that I'd seen. And um, that I think, is the idea of, you know, you would spend no more than $10,000 uh, to give a four year degree. My idea was that that $10,000 $10, would be the cost of delivery, not the sticker price. That's amazing. So actually, yeah. you could imagine a scenario, given the subsidies we already have, right. you can imagine it being a free education, but the key thing that you do is try to change the cost structure. That's what I was really focusing on. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, and in fact, one of the ways to do that is to sort of get rid of the higher education aid apparatus, the admissions counselors, the financial aid counselors, the compliance counselors, and, and of course these, these enrollment management people, I think all of them should go. Um, so what I was, I was focusing on, you know, Clark Kerr, who was a president of University of California system in the 60s, um, introduced this idea called a master plan. And he wanted there to be tiers. He wanted higher education to specialize. And he wanted there to be flagship institutions that were responsible for knowledge production, um, these sort of mid-tier uh, universities that awarded nothing higher than a master's degree, and the community colleges that accepted all comers. And I sort of adopted this idea of a master plan um, in this report, and I talk about um, what I call the, the cohort colleges, um, the adult online institutions, and then the flagship schools, and then I have a fourth category I called micro pop-up. Mm -hmm. um, so my idea here is I'm sort of I'm taking bits and pieces of you know things like MOOCs, the the, the, the massive open online courses, free courses, 
um, things like, uh, and then basically conceptualizing different categories of students. So um, in the cohort colleges, it's kind of like an updated community college. Um, it's something like this CUNY plan where you basically have, you know, you have a first time student who may not be very confident as most of our public high school graduates are not. Um, and they want it to be free, they want it to be very supportive, they want to be with a group of, st of students that they know really well. It's probably important for them to be in person. They don't have great records of completing uh, online programs. So you want them... It's students who need a lot of structure. It's students who need a lot of structure and support and they want, you know, they have trained teachers, they have a core curriculum that's pretty strict for the first two years, and what you're doing during that time is you're really scaffolding them to learn how to learn. And this is modeled on the, the, the START and the ASAP program out of CUNY that has you know, these really great results. Um, the adult online institution is based on more of a MOOC model or an online model. You're, you're positing someone who is, um, or a Western Governors University, which has gotten pretty well known for its sort of innovative approaches. And they, they're targeting very explicitly like someone who's in their 30s, late 30s, and has a lot of work experience. It's a big chunk of people who are seeking higher education right now. People are trying totally. to better their lives by getting a degree, yeah. Absolutely, you need, you need lifelong uh, education, I think, to compete. And these are also often people who have lots of valuable skills, have learned an enormous amount of the course of their work, right. yet who don't have a degree to show for it. Great, so a, a really interesting interesting component and, and something that's actually growing um, due to Department of Education changes is the idea of competency-based learning. And what you're doing there is you're really, you're kind of throwing out seat time or class hours as a requirement. And you're saying, we want you to demonstrate learning. We want you to codify it and, um, and explain in your own words what you've learned, reflect on the process of learning, do some metacognition, and complete assessments that we're fully confident in that we vetted that if you do these assessments correctly, then you have demonstrated the knowledge that you need for this course. The University of Wisconsin has, has rolled this out in a really big way. They call it the flex degree. Basically, if you complete the assessments, then you can get a diploma without having to go through the formality process of a certain kind of teaching and learning um, that a university has determined that this is the best way for you to learn. So while the cohort colleges are for people who need a lot of support, the adult online universities are for people who have a little bit more experience, but they need flexibility uh, rather than that really rigid support. Right. Um, and they can also move a little more quickly because they can demonstrate the skills they've already accumulated over the course of their lives. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, right. So those, and, and that is sort of, um, that's an established model as well in some mm. ways. Um, what I'm bringing to, like, my, in my imaginary world that's new is the idea that those are really integrated with the work of the flagships. So what happens in a modern day flagship in, in this model um, is research. Is it's like a UC Berkeley, a University of Michigan, these very elite public institutions. Right, but what makes it a little bit different is that, I mean, you've, so you've got all of the, the functions, the research, if you want to have extracurriculars, you can, although they're, they're offloaded, they're not part of the main budget. Um, and it is residential, but what I would like to see is the ability for more people to experience low residency. They come to an institution like that that it really feels that it belongs to the people of that entire state. And whether they want to come for a three-week three -week program or a three-month program or an exchange program, that, um, that they're able to participate. And, and there's a much broader number of people that are able to participate in the intellectual life that we see on the best campuses. So, you know, most kids uh, going to college now, they're commuters. Uh, they don't necessarily have that residential experience. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas kids in these flagship schools, they have an experience that's a lot like kids at private colleges. I mean, it, it's, a, it's right. a very kind of elite, cloistered kind of community. So what you're saying is, your publicness means that you need to share this experience with other people yeah. so they can get the most out of it at different times. But right. how are, what are some other ways the, the kind of flagship publics would change? Well, I think that the, um, you know, the, the converse point of that as well is that the four-year experience, which is often a six-year experience right now, which is really marred um, and, and academically adrift, he talks about this a lot, you know, 38% of students, 36% of students, I think, study less than five hours a week. Um, in these institutions. So there's not the real cloistered academic atmosphere that we'd like to see. Um, and what, what marks, I think, some of the best uh, educational experiences these days is a real um, window and, and a way to rotate through into the world of work, into the world of service and travel and volunteerism and all the wonderful things that, that sort of um, accompany and complement the, the residential four-year college experience. So I would like to see these institutions really, um, you know, enable many more students to take place. And while they're rotating, the main campus students are rotating out and these other students are rotating in. Um, and then finally, what the, what the flagships do in this model is they are responsible for 
creating and maintaining these open educational resources, the, the, the massive open online courses, um, the, the, um, the adaptive learning software systems, and actually conducting research on teaching and learning to continue to develop their effectiveness and to make these resources more and more and more useful for students at all levels, not only uh, you know, at their institutions in their states, um, but across the sectors and, and indeed around the world. So if I'm a tenured professor at a flagship state university, um, part of my job will be I need to think about how to improve the kind of uh, quality of instruction for students throughout the system. Right. Uh, and we're going to devote a lot more resources to this uh, because we're the place that has the most resources. Right. So instead of the schools that attract the lion's share of the resources um, being places that are doing the most to compete um, you know, with other elite schools around the country, you know, what they're really trying to do is we're going to we deserve these resources because we're going to use them to better education for everyone, including those who don't get to be here year-round. You know, I think that we really see that motivation and that impetus amongst some of the best faculty members and best researchers of our genera of these generations. I mean, nobody has taken up blogging and, and being public on Twitter and engaged better than some of our great economists, some of our great legal scholars, some of our great cultural critics. Uh, a lot of these people are very, very engaged because the more I think, you know, I think really is the mark of a school of a true scholar and someone who really loves their discipline that they want to share, you know, their findings and their and their ideas with the world. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, for example, the the professors from Stanford who started the, some of the MOOC platforms, the Audacity and the Coursera, uh, and and many of the professors I've spoken with who have created um, MOOCs, um, talk about you know the red pill and the blue pill effect. Once you've taught. 200,000 people in a single semester, you can't go back to teaching your, your 200 students or your, 100, you know, your 15 students in a seminar. Yeah, it's funny because, so, you know, there's, we haven't really talked in great detail about this, but, you know, when you think about these massive, um, you know, online open courses, mm -hmm. there's a lot of controversy around them. Yeah. And a lot of the controversy stems from the idea that, well, look, people sign up and they don't finish the courses. Right. But you know, one thing I was thinking about is that, well, when you think about elite universities, mm -hmm. there are people who apply who right. don't get in. And then there are people who go who don't necessarily, you know, or whatever. But you already have this huge sieve. So when right. you're thinking about a, a MOOC, it's kind of like it doesn't seem fair to compare the completion rate for the bunch of people who think about, well, maybe I'll sign up for this course very casually. I mean, right. I've certainly signed up for courses I've never finished yeah. uh, online. Um, but, you know, what you're saying is that what I find intriguing is do you now see people compete to be more open? Right. Do you, you think this is happening? Because it seems like you know, through the history of higher education in this country, people have been competing to be more closed. Right. The way to climb the U.S. news ranking is to be as exclusive as possible, to reject as many people as possible, to get a 5% acceptance rate, right. and that means that I'm awesome. Right. Whereas now, you know, if you look at edX, you look at some of these other MOOC platforms, it seems like something different is happening. I totally agree. I find this so exciting, this idea that in, in the matter of months, literally, the, the Ivy League institutions went from saying how exclusive we are to how open we are and how many people we're serving and what a great impact that we're having. Um, Why and, is that? Well, because I think that the the values are changing in the in the new economy in the new millennia. Like I think that we have we have social media. People understand the power of massive connection and. Any institution that is, you know, this is an information economy, and any institution that's an information-based institution has to measure its impact in terms of the number of people who pay attention to it. I mean, that's just, um, you know, that's the metric that exists now, and it's incontrovertible. It's kind of cool because it's kind of cool that they're now scared of being irrelevant. Yes. And so this fear of irrelevancy yes. is actually making them do something that might actually benefit people, you know, right. people in India, people in... Gabon. Not only in might, but it absolutely demonstrably does. I mean, the, the Harvard and uh, MIT just released a big research study of um, over 400,000 participants in several different courses that were originally Harvard and MIT courses that were now free to the world. About three quarters of the participants are from overseas. And surprisingly to me, about a third of them have less than a high school degree. So as much as we see that, um, you know, particularly in the United States, MOOCs are not quite disrupting the sector of higher education that we thought they were going to. You know, they're not necessarily disrupting the need for a first diploma or a first degree, that sort of cohort college experience, because you really do need to know how to learn in order to yeah. effectively take advantage of free um, educational resources. But, um, but certainly there are those people, you know, around the world who do have that incredible motivation and that incredible amount of talent that these MOOCs are now allowing them to demonstrate. Um, 
And, and another, just from that recent research, another really interesting way of thinking about you know, the impact of MOOCs and the completion rates, one, one frame that I've heard which makes a lot of sense is this idea of, of all the people who look at a Duke brochure versus the people who get a Duke degree. That, that's one way of looking at it. But Absolutely. with a MOOC, you, know, you have a choice of looking at it in some ways as a course, or you could look at it as like a book in the library, or you could look at it as a piece of online media. And um, when my friend Justin Reich, who does the, the research for edX, was uh, giving a presentation about this, he had someone come up to him who worked in the online media world, and he said, do you understand how unbelievable your engagement rates are? You know, from the point of view of an online video, of the number of people that actually come to your site, the percentage that spend hours on that site, hours. You know, it, you don't get that. You don't get that in Vice. You don't get that with naked sex videos. I yeah. mean, this is just, this is an unprecedented level of engagement with the very highest productions of our culture. Like, it should give you hope for the future of humanity, if nothing else. So you're now working on a book that is related to some of your earlier concerns, but in a somewhat different direction. Mm -hmm. You're working on a book called The Test. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that it is about standardized testing and how it's been used in America. What led you to want to write about this? Well, a couple of things. You know, I, I, I love the higher ed discussion, but I felt the need to sort of push my, my thoughts and my inquiries in a new direction. And, you know, I, I had a child myself, so I started looking more at, um, at, at K-12 education and early early education. And uh, I had written an entire proposal for a book sort of a, similar to DIYU, which is very much about some of the innovations in public education or in, in K-12. And um, it didn't, it rang a little bit hollow. You know, I was looking at things that were very much on the margins. It didn't, and um, it just wasn't connecting. And I sat down with my agent and talked about it with him. And, you know, what I came to realize was that there are a lot of great ideas in, in K-12 and public education right now but they're not happening because of, of testing, because of standardized tests and the accountability system connected with them, starting with No Child Left Behind, essentially. I mean, it, you know, obviously the origins go way back before that, but tests are this giant Hoover Dam that stand in the way of really thinking clearly and implementing the ideas that we have about what's really important for kids to know, um, and, and not only to know, but, but ways of being in the world, you know, um, emotional attitudes, mental attitudes, all these things that, that scientists are discovering that um, really lead to success and impact success much more than anything that's measured by almost any kind of paper and pencil test. But in fairness, I mean, you said earlier on that one problem with higher education is their their lack of willingness to um, be accountable in various mm -hmm. ways. And, you know, it just seems that without some kind of rigorous tests, um, you're operating blind. You know, I'm not against the idea of, of rigorous tests and of accountability. I'm not against the idea of rigor and not against the idea of accountability. I argue, and I think I demonstrate in the book, that um, that the tests that we have don't provide rigor and they don't provide accountability. They're so easily manipulable that um, they actually end up being completely meaningless. So like because of test prep and... and I'm not even you. talking about... I mean, something as simple as the cut score. So, you know, you might think that the psychometricians that design tests and sell them to states are the ones that determine where the pass rate should be. In fact, no. It's the states, the state educational boards that decide that 68 is, is a pass score in on one test and, and 75 is a test. Pass, you know, is a passing score on another test. And these um, standards are so out of whack that um, in a study, there was a study done by um, NWEA, which is a, a, an independent nonprofit testing company that does low stakes diagnostic testing to give the same test to kids all across the country. And they took the test scores of 18 schools and they could correlate them pretty well to what the test scores would be on the state tests in those schools. If those 18 schools had been in Wisconsin, 17% of them, 17 of the 18 would have made adequate yearly progress. If those 18 schools had been in Massachusetts, zero of them would have made adequate yearly progress. So there's no comparability in the way the test scores are, are decided. So even in terms of the things that people who are pro-test want them to do, they're actually failing along, uh, by those standards. You know, people are really bad at math. <laughs> and numbers seem so, um, uh, so uh, objective. Numbers just seem objective. And, when you put those two things together, you get you know test scores unlike pollution data, unlike GDP, unlike any other number that a politician is accountable to, test scores can pretty much be ordered up to say whatever you want them to say. And that's pretty much exactly what's been happening. Um, there's a, there's a, a pretty clear example of this uh, recently in the transition to the common core tests, which are you know by any measure much harder. So uh, they're being given to students in, in New York City and Kentucky ahead of the rest of the country. And in the places where they have been given, 
um, test scores have dropped 25, 30 points in one year. And so what that means by the accountability structures that we have in place, it means that our students are 25 to 30% dumber, our teachers are 25 to 30% worse at teaching, and all of our schools are a third you know, more likely to be failing. Um, is that true because of the meaning of one test? No, obviously not, but it's written into these formulas which have put the numbers on the test above any other reasonable criteria. Anya, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate your having taken the time. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun.